I, I like how we, we both showed up representing 1993 in our yep. clothing. And uh, what do you, oh, I was like, what are you about to show me? <laughs> 93 tramp stamp, baby. <laughs> Oh, and have a have a bit of arse on this uh, this show. Um, for those of you, well, the show I charge extra now. for that. <laughs> for those of you in the podcast world, I'm wearing a uh, Anthrax Sound of White Noise T-shirt, and Eddie Sparks is wearing a Nirvana in Euro shirt. Um, so mm-hmm. that ticks off two of the albums that I'm sure we're probably going to talk about yeah. <laughs> in this episode, which is our top ten favorite albums of 1993. Hello and welcome to Cranked and Ranked. Boom. Now we're smooth. Now we can, yeah, I don't smooth know what, ass transition. Sometimes it, it flows very nicely, and other times there's just all kinds of roadblocks in the way that I got to get around. But um, well, I have I have good news. Oh, sweet! I'm getting I'm getting my car service tomorrow, so I have to stay here tonight, so I don't have to drive. Bada oh shit! Bing, bada bing. What are we What are we drinking? What is this? Uh, Carlsberg Premium Export. Pretty Carlsberg. standard. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I, I didn't drink Carlsberg for like a solid six months after download 2022. Having <laughs> because premi- that's, that's premium, all I drank. <laughs> premium water from the hey. fridge. <laughs> nice. I, to be fair, to be fair, I do have water here too. But yeah, I've always, I've always wanted to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and now I have I, the opportunity. And you know what? If we if it was the other way around, and and when we recorded these, it was during the day for you and night for me. I'd probably always have a beer. But yeah. Sun su- Sunday when we record these, letting peek behind the curtain, everybody. Yeah. Uh, Sundays at one o'clock p.m. is uh, not drinking time for me. I'm not I'm not an alcoholic, so um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've I've never enjoyed day drinking ever. Mm. Um, and, uh, so it's always like sun's got to be starting to go down and then I'm like, all right, now I'll have a beer. And I always, and I reserve all that for the, that for the, the weekend or when I don't have to work the next day. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't remember if I brought it up on the show at any point, but if anyone goes back and watches the, uh, slashed and mashed we did on load and reload, I was shit faced. (laughs) Wasn't there a Christmas one too, that you were pretty lit? A holiday one we did, I think, or uh, something like that. I I think I think so, but the 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 <laughs> the fucking uh, slashed and mash load and reload one was I completely forgot it was a Sunday, and we were having this like Easter dinner, and there was okay, the, and and yeah. the the fridge was stacked with alcohol, and I just kept chugging them and the moment one ended another one opened and i just yeah. remember i got to about 6 30 and i was on the floor like Woo! <laughs> and so, someone someone walked in and said hello eddie no podcast tonight and i got up from the floor went shit <laughs> went in <laughs> and i think i prefaced it before the episode i said i said to you yeah just a heads up I am wankered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nah, nah. I'm that, was, a, that was fun. I'm, I'm pretty steady. I'm pretty steady right now. Yeah. I've got a light buzz. Cool. Which is I'm uh, so so yeah. So this is the one of the the year episodes of Cranked and Ranked, where you know normally we do artist discography rankings, and today we're doing top ten from a particular year, but top top ten our top ten favorites because yes. there, there's really no other way to to do that kind of thing. Any, any type of like top 10 when it comes to different artists and, and, and everything released in a particular year. That's why I get really been out of shape when people do like best of the year. And I'm like, no, 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 your favorites of the year. Like that's yeah. don't, because it's, that's just, that's that it is something so uh, arrogant to me about yeah. presenting something as these are the best. And I'm just like, eh, probably not. Uh, so that's why I'm saying these are our top 10 favorites of 1993. Man, when I was I was 15 years old in 1993, is that math? I mean, yeah. I was negative five. Yeah. So my m- memory of that's kind of hazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, 93 was a big year. Like, 
I, I would say probably if I was going to pick the year that I that I really started to feel like music was my thing and I was switched on with everything and that was my life. It was it kind of started in the late 80s and then built and built and built in 1993, I think is really the start of like literally everything in every day was music for me. And then that just never ended. It's still going now. So uh, it's a special year. And it was really tough to do this because there's so many great albums that came out in 93 that I left out ones that I love. And just looking at even the placement of the albums, they're like my number 10. I'm just like, th- this had to be at number 10 for for this year. It's a big, it's a big year. Uh, hmm. A lot of, a lot of big albums. I, this might be like of all of the, of all of the year episodes we've ever done on this show. I think this is among the most interesting because mm-hmm. like 93 for me is kind of like, you know, looking back on, you know, the sort of stuff I listen to. I tend to think to myself, 91 and 92 are like my main focus for that early 90s stuff. A little bit of 1990 in there as well. Mm -hmm. And 94, but I tend to always find that 93 for me is this like forgotten year where loads of my favorite bands from that time were actually touring the album that came out one or two years prior. So, you know, it's one of those years where I'm like, oh, that one came out this year? Holy shit. You know, I... um. And 94 is stacked yeah. with with crazy amounts. We did 94, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay. I'm sure we did, right? I don't know. My my memory is not. Yeah. We've done so many episodes, dude. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that I just, that I lose, like, I remember specific artists, but when it comes to years, I don't remember all of them, and I don't even remember what I chose. And I'm pretty sure if we went back, like, once we're done with the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we could probably just start over again. And the list, the list will probably <laughs> yeah. be slightly different. Mm. Um, but uh, but let's get this out of the way, though. If we were including box sets, the number one thing that came out in 1993 was live shit, binge, and purge. Like that is, yep. that is. Cause I thought about that because I saw that came out in '93. I'm like, well, luckily it's not an album. I mean, there's a live album in there, but I mm. didn't include it because it's a box set. But that that is like one of the greatest things ever for me. I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> oh shit! Okay, never mind. There, there are there there is a uh, a couple of firsts for me when it comes to year rankings. Um, so this will be an interesting one. Fuck it, let's just let's jump into it. Um, nineteen ninety three. You weren't born. I was fifteen, and uh, music was awesome. So uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's let's get this shit started. What what is your number ten album for nineteen ninety three? Okay, so kicking it off, we have the album on my t-shirt, In Utero, at number 10. Nice. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the most iconic albums of the 90s, let alone the grunge era. Mm-hmm. Uh, in stark contrast to Nevermind, this album opts for a grittier and, and more lo-fi approach to the production. Yeah. Uh, but despite the change in presentation, this is still a Nirvana album through and through. Yeah, it boasts the classics, Heart Shaped Box, All Apologies, Rape Me. Like, there's so many great songs on this. And I just think it's emblematic of the era that an album with a song like Scentless Apprentice at track two was so successful. Dude. Yeah. That, yeah. that I, 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 I can remember getting in utero the day it came out on cd and coming home and i used to always like new album you know in the evening i would sit down and i would literally sit like there my stereo was there and i would sit in front of my stereo holding the cd and nice. looking through the things and i remember the first time i heard the beginning of sinless apprentice because coming out of 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 serve the servants that song wasn't like a huge surprise to me. I was like, yeah, this is a pretty good song. It obviously doesn't have the punch of a smells like teen spirit, but it's a great song. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I, I you know, I, I, I see where they're going. I'm into this. But then as soon as you hear that, dum, 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 
I was just like, ho, ho. Yeah. Like it was like game over. I was just like, the I was so, and then following that up with, with, with a uh, heart shaped box. Like that is, yeah, I was so, I was, I remember just like falling in love with this album as it was playing through. And I'm yeah. just like, God, man, it was, it was beyond my expectations because even as a 15 year old, I, I didn't know it at the time, but even as a 15 year old, I, wanted bands to do different things hmm. and i really enjoyed it when i heard those things so yeah like i i, I that this album was a bit more of a grower for me mm -hmm. than never mind for obvious reasons because oh, you yeah know, when, yeah you know when, when you when you hear never mind you think this is a really pristinely produced timeless rock album mm -hmm. and then this album is kind of almost a rejection of that where it's like well bleach was really raw borderline metal and aggressive let's you know if if nevermind was their stadium rock album they were like okay we're going full-blown punk now we've proven that we can do you know the metallic thing the stadium rock thing now let's do what we i think this is the closest thing that was as true to Kurt Cobain as anything yeah. ever that came out. I, I feel like I, I think so. Yeah, th I feel like this was the album where he was like, "Well, yeah, I've got full license to do whatever the fuck I want now." Yeah, um, you know. And tragically, this album came out what less than a year, maybe less. How how long was it? September, October, November. December, January, a little over a year, right? I don't know. Uh, no, under a year, which is oh, wild. Shit. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It seemed it, all, all of that stuff didn't seem like it happened so close together when I, yeah. when I was then like the in utero coming out and, and him dying, that feels like it's years apart. Yeah. Not a yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, honestly, this is this is a great album, excellent stuff. Um, I always thought the uh, album cover was really cool too. Yeah, that's a yeah, the whole package really awesome stuff. Yeah, um, and I like that there's moments on it like uh, Tourette's and and you know, fucking what's it called, radio friendly unit shifter. I like, love that one. Yeah, yeah the, the whole album is just this smorgasbord really because there's some softer moments like uh is it milk it or or no dumb no sorry i was thinking yeah, of dumb. dumb yeah uh, yeah i mean you got you got dumb and and penny well penny royalty is not completely soft but i mean and of course all apologies which to me is like one of the greatest songs ever all written. apologies is one of my alarms in the morning like oh really yeah and and i gotta be honest I, i'm not sick of it like yeah every every time i hear that yeah. like yeah i i really like in utero yeah me too and i can see it being much further up your list than it was oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah um are you done now yeah yeah so the, so this is insane that i'm about to talk about this album at number 10 for me um, honestly, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I only think that we're going to have two albums that are the same on our list. Wow. I, okay. I'd be surprised if any of my other albums show up on your list, but they could, you never know. They could maybe one other, but two for sure. Okay. Um, but, uh, my number 10 is independent by cool. sacred Reich. I brought all my records because you know, I might as well, I buy them. I'm going to show them off. Yeah. Um, Sacred Right, this is crazy putting it at 10 because they're one of my favorite bands of all time. And I love this album. This album was, uh, the, uh, I started playing guitar. Um, the song independent was the first song I learned on guitar R rudimentary. It's an easy song to play, but even rudimentarily, I learned like the one string approach and then kind of, yeah, kind of built yeah. from there. Um, but I love this album because of the things that I'm saying were like, you know, in, in utero came out and I didn't, I don't think I heard independent until much. I don't remember when it came out in 93, but I feel like it was later, way later in the year. Uh, but in utero, 
Nirvana doing something different, independent Sacred Reich doing something different. And it didn't even, it didn't even make a, I mean, I loved it, but I didn't know that was why. And, and also I didn't understand other people that would hear albums and go, Oh, why do they got to do something different? And I was always just like, well, why wouldn't they? It seemed like such a given to me that if you did more than one album, you wouldn't just do the same shit again because you did it already, especially if it was successful and people like it. It's like, you did it. That album's already there. So they, so they got together and they did this, which is like, there's a few like Dave Jordan produced albums from around this time, Dirt being one of them. Um, and this one, they all have this really unique sound that sounds very early 90s, but also sounds different than a lot of other early 90s albums. It's yeah, it's an interesting recording technique that a few that the several albums around that time all have that were all done by Dave Jordan. Um, and I love that. I just love the 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 sound of this album and how they sort of stripped down what they were doing, but the energy's still there. And, uh, and Phil, I love Phil Wren so much. I can listen to him sing a phone book. I don't care. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and, uh, yeah, so, so, but it, it goes at number 10 because God, that like literally everything else in my stack, like some things are just so definitively 1993 some things are very personal for me in other ways so then when i ended up ordering things i was like god independent goes at 10. <laughs> Shit. um so that's that's the kind of year we're dealing with but yeah i i independence a fucking killer album and uh yeah i don't know what else to say about it it's it's at my my number 10. i will say when we did the sacred Reich episode um uh, i think i had that one in last place and that album has grown on me a lot I nice. I think I think at the time when I was listening to it, it was like I don't I don't know. I must have just not been in the mood for that sort of thing when I listened to it. But I've listened to it since and think what, what the fuck was I thinking? But then again, when you're ranking albums by Sacred Reich, some everything has to go somewhere. Yeah, and they are pretty consistently badass throughout. So yeah. That that being said, I guess that brings me to my number nine. Number nine, yeah. Number nine, and the um, number nine reference is going to tie in kind of to this because my number nine is Doggy Style. Nice. Um, back back yeah. when he was called Snoop Doggy Dog. Doggy Dog. Dog. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, frankly, we need some G Funk representation on the show, being as it is my favorite uh, hip hop genre. You know, we yeah. can all thank GTA San Andreas for. Yeah, my entire the you know the following generation, including myself, huge fans of the West Coast sound. Yeah, uh, I mean, who am I? What's my name? Gin and Juice, Murder Was a Case. I mean, this this album, this and the Chronic. I, I mean, dude, we could do a slashed and mashed on that. That would be so sick. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, I was thinking about that earlier, but honestly, every time I've listened to this album, I'm just like vibing the entire way through. Yeah. And it's just 55 minutes of great, smoothly delivered G Funk goodness. And uh, I adore it. Uh, so much so, it's one of the few hip hop albums I actually have on vinyl as of right now. I need to expand my, my collection. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this both nwa albums and my next next in line is going to be is going to be the chronic but honestly i've i've loved this album for a long time now and it's 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 great yeah it's great there's so but, much charisma and i love the guest features as well on it but yeah. honestly honestly what you got a a history with this album well i mean I was more of a fan of the Chronic back then, yeah. um, but I, but the one thing that I do love, especially especially about 1993, because it's post Chronic, is that is that you know for somebody like me that was a 15 year old kid that spent so much time watching MTV, it was so cool that all of this music that I really liked was 
coming up to the mainstream. So you had hip hop, you had metal, you yes. had grunge, all of this stuff was there was some representation of that in the regular daytime MTV programming, as opposed yeah. to having Yo MTV raps or Headbangers Ball because those things weren't mainstream enough. But now it was all trickling in. And that, along with some of the great, you know, R&B of the early 90s, it just made that's one of the things that just, you know, I what I feel like I was the perfect age because I think there are people older and younger than me that don't understand that a lot of us were into all of that music. Mm. Like I was, I would have been considered a metal head, but I was listening also to, you know, in vogue or, yeah. uh, or, or Dr. Dre um, and all of that stuff. Just like, Dude, Funky Davis is fucking great. <laughs> yeah, so it's just so so in the so all of that stuff was it, it was it by 1993. I feel like that was probably kind of the last of when you also had metal in the mainstream because very quickly by the mid 90s, uh, metal was kind of pushed to the side yeah. um, and and re re relegated to the the non mainstream again. Um, but then kind of bubbled up again later with new metal. But I, but you know, ninety three seemed like it was such a great year just because it it felt like all of this great music was getting the attention that it deserved, and and so um, so when so the Snoop Dogg album was was also on my radar just because I loved that hip hop of the time. So, but it's oh, not yeah. that's not a, funny enough. It's not on my list though. So. That's the thing, though, when, when you're picking albums for these lists, like the early 90s is just so stacked with quality stuff. Yeah. It's just, yeah. But, yeah, that's, that's my number nine. That's my okay. number nine. Number so nine. This, this is actually a perfect transition because it. I talked about 1993 and these great different styles of music kind of coexisting together. And this will bring us to uh, one of you know, a first – on here where a soundtrack is in my top 10 nice. and that is nice. judgment night this soundtrack this i so this ended up being on in my top 10 because it's fucking rules but also it's so 1993 yeah like, this wouldn't wouldn't like even like later on like that's the thing that like kind of got lost with the new metal stuff is that the metal artists thought they needed to be doing the hip hop and I'm and I'm like sometimes that's good hmm. but the this idea of actual hip hop artists and actual rock and metal artists collaborating collaborating for original songs for a soundtrack for why this movie? I don't know. I don't know I, the story behind why it came together for this movie, but and the movies, it's all right. Like it's, I, I haven't even seen the movie, but I'm very familiar with the soundtrack. I, it's 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 an enjoyable early. See, it's an interesting movie because it's an early '90s kind of low key action movie. It's more of like a like a a dark suspenseful action movie. There's not tons of explosions and car chases. It's kind of a slow burning '90s action movie. Yeah, and it's not. It's good, but it's not this good. See what I'm saying? Like this mm. soundtrack is beyond what the movie is. But I do enjoy the movie. But like, just the Helmet and House of Pain collab alone is fucking amazing. But. Onyx and Biohazard, it, it, Run DMC and Living Color, Ice T and Slayer doing exploited songs. Yeah. How fucking amazing is that? De La Soul and Teenage Fan Club, I love that one. Uh, Booyah Tribe and Faith No More. Although, that's like, the crown. That's the I, crown jewel. For me. I like that song, but I've always hated the fact that they didn't. Faith No More didn't do more because hmm. the music's kind of not very interesting and mike Patton just goes Whoa. Whoa. Um, <laughs> so and but yeah but it's like everybody from you know from helmet to pearl jam or whatever are all on this soundtrack 
And it was such a big deal. And and really, this is 93 is the last time I can really remember soundtracks coming out where it was exciting. Because when, cause when was, yeah, because pr- prior to this, I don't know when The Crow was. Was The Crow also 93? Or the Crow was, was 90, 94. 94. 94 if I remember right. So The Crow was another one. So there were around that time these big soundtracks that really like were almost more exciting than the movies um, in a lot yeah. of times. But but quickly that became a thing that nobody cared about anymore. And I don't know why. There have been other good soundtracks, but not that good. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway... But it's one, it's just it's such a 1993 thing, you know, dude. The fucking the soundtrack to the Crow is, I mean, St- Stone Temple Pilots, Nine Inch Nails, Rage Against the Machine, yeah. Rollins Band, Helmet, Pantera. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. But that see, but and man, that one was one another one where I, w- I went to the movie and I left it going like this movie's not very good, which is weird <laughs> that it's gotten a cult following, and I'm just like. I understand that there's like a mystique around it now, but at the time <laughs> you left the theater going, the acting was really bad. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, but it was, it, it is what it is, but uh, that's not, that's not this year. So this year we got judgment night. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's my number nine. My, uh, my, my first soundtrack ever to be included in a in a, a year ranking cool and i'm very happy to talk about it so let's let's move on to your uh, your number eight i'm amazed we haven't done a soundtracks episode yet yeah, we'll have to do a sidebar with that just our favorite soundtracks yeah 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 i think so that's a good one yeah i, uh, I got pl- i got plenty to talk about so shit yeah, shit. yeah. awesome right well i i guess that brings me to my number eight my number mm-hmm. eight is individual thought patterns by death Ooh, sweet nice one yeah this now if i remember right our combined opinion as of the death episode from the first season of cranked and ranked that was an early episode like 2020 Mm -hmm. uh i believe we both had this as our number one right i i I believe so it would be my number one it's my favorite death album so yeah yeah i mean this this album I mean, the philosopher alone makes this one of yeah. my most essential death metal albums. But like, right from the moment overactive imagination starts to the very end of the philosopher, you're just thrown through this absolute hell ride of of you know progressive, technical, but also catchy and memorable stuff yeah. that just fucking pummels you and shreds you up right through it but i mean my god this album i remember hearing it when we did the death episode and this and this was one of those this was one of those times where it was, we'd picked a band that i kind of passively knew a few songs but mm-hmm. had never done the deep dive and i remember leaving it a very big fan of death with them at the time my favorite death metal band they they have since been surpassed only just by obituary but mm-hmm. you know yeah this show's been a really good excuse for me to just delve into extreme metal more because it was something i was always a fan of but just yeah never, never dove deeper into but i mean i think it's kind of underrated as well like yeah. every, everybody everybody points to um leprosy e- leprosy or in my experience a lot of people point to uh what what's the last one sound sound of perseverance as their favorite and i'm like mm-hmm. guys i'm just saying are we forgetting this one and i mean look at the fucking lineup on this dude i mean obviously you got chuck mm-hmm. you got andy la rock steve de giorgio yep. and gene hoglan yeah are we kidding like, yeah this is just virtuosos all over the place um yeah just incredible stuff Mm -hmm. blows my mind to this day and i think it's a travesty that that this is one of the albums that has since been rendered ruined slightly by a oh yeah by a nasty remaster yeah it's it's not the worst 
it's not the worst uh, remaster ever, but it's it's it, I don't. I mean, I don't know if it's since been redone, but it's just one particular one that is just it gets in, on my nerves how bad they <laughs> they fucked it up. Um, yeah. But it's it's so it's funny that you bring this up because I'm looking at my list now and 1993 for me even even aside from all of these killer albums I would say was the year of death metal for me because I got so into death metal in 93. Wow. But there's only one album on my list that could even be connected to death metal. That's the amount of music I love that came out that year. And I just don't know what to do with myself. I had to leave out so many great albums. And but but in '93, that was when I was I fully jumped in to to uh, death metal. But yeah. But move. I got okay. I'm, I'm going to move on. We you ready to awesome. move on? Moving yeah, on to dude. my number eight, to very much not death metal, but uh, one of the most influential albums to me uh, as a musician. Uh, in on the Kill Taker by Fugazi. I knew this. I knew this would be here. Yeah, I this is I, the my favorite Fugazi album, and um, really like really influential when it came to like me. I saw I talked about this when we talked to, when you did the Fugazi episode, but this one like influenced my guitar playing, influenced my songwriting, influenced me being in a band, just like yeah. what I wanted and 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 what I wanted to accomplish whenever I was in bands even if i wasn't playing music that sounded like fugazi um but it's just such an amazing record and i think for me it, it, it's my favorite and and it kind of it would make sense for a lot of people because i'm into heavier music and it's their heaviest album mm. but um it's just like so ridiculously cool and um yeah I, it really as a guitar player that's it's like there's there's certain albums that pushed me along in a in a direction and like you know helmet meantime is one of them yeah um, and then and on the kilt taker it's just there's just certain albums that connected with me to where like i felt like that's what i wanted to play and how i wanted to play um because i never as much as i loved all of the you know crazy good guitar players like you know you know, like fucking, you know, Rust in Peace. If I, I, I never wanted to learn how to play songs off of Rust in Peace. It didn't, I love that album so much and it's so important to me, but it didn't connect with me in that respect. Hmm. And I think that that's always thought that was very interesting because so much of what I listen to on a day-to-day -day basis is metal. You could, yeah. couldn't call it anything else. But yet the music that I always seem to connect with as a musician and a songwriter is always a little more um fringy uh we alt metal or or even grungy or whatever or you know fugazi yeah. would have been post hardcore or whatever you know that that stuff is the stuff that really connects with me and then on the kill taker probably is is really the beginning of that of the post hardcore elements seeping into to who i was um but I didn't hear that album until like a couple years later. So, um, but uh, but yeah, that's my number. What are we on? Number eight, Fugazi. Cool. Fugazi. Now they got some interesting lyrics. God damn, I want to find. I've searched for that commercial so many times and I can't find it. If anybody finds it, because it's a Best Buy commercial. That's all I remember was that I worked at Best Buy, and they would show us the brand new Best Buy commercials at our team meetings to get us hyped. You know. And they and they were doing all these different themed Best Buy commercials, and one of them was like the alternative music Best Buy commercial. Right, and I right. think it was two dudes playing pool or something, and they were talking about all these different artists. And then the one guy goes, Fugazi. Now they got some interesting lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Anyway. Uh, cool. Uh so I guess that brings me to number seven. Number seven. Okay, so my number seven is Stain by Living Color. Oh, shit. See, this one didn't make my list. See, this is yeah. fucking insane. Fucking insane. Yeah. I think the good thing about this, though, is that, you know, we'll, we'll 
essentially get like a top 20 yeah with our combined lists <laughs> yeah so i although i have i have a i have a sneaking suspicion that there's going to be one particular album that's going to be in your list that isn't wouldn't be part of my top 20 but so far we've built a pretty great uh top 20. <laughs> well th this this one here uh i remember going into the living color episode mm -hmm. knowing the first two albums really well and having heard about stain but like i just i, I never got around to listening to stain yeah. but it, because it was 93 i did you know go into it thinking okay this is gonna sound like living color uh, and it does but it's like if living color the color this time was just really dark you know yeah this is yeah. this is like the heavier um it's like they took all the heaviest parts of vivid and um times up times up in particular if you if you just did like the heavy stuff a lot that's what you get here uh yeah. i mean leave, now, leave it alone i can't i feel so stupid that this isn't in my list i can't even <laughs> begin to explain so i'm glad you're talking about it I mean, to be fair, I hadn't listened to this album in a long time, but I listened mm -hmm. to it back and I was like, this has to go on here. Yeah. Um, Leave It Alone, Auslander, Nothingness, by great songs, mm -hmm. very underrated album. Yeah. Um, and like, I just, I, I long for a time where this, there's like a balance in the early 90s that just makes everything just so chef's kiss perfect to my ears and yeah. i think that i think that is the mixture of recording technology getting really good and timeless sounding yeah but before the point where everybody was like we have to compress everything to shit yeah um, so you've got these mixes that just have so much energy to them and they're they're nice and spacious and I mean, I probably say this on every episode at this point, but that's why I love these albums so much and this this whole era. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this is an underappreciated album. It gets unfairly shadowed by Vivid, and and I think Times Up even gets unfairly overshadowed by Vivid. Yeah. But but Vivid's fucking fantastic. Uh, so it's living color going a little heavier being a little darker um and they, they said it themselves this is probably like the closest to metal we ever got yeah uh didn't they they changed bass players on this one though didn't they they got doug yep. doug wimbish doug yeah. wimbish instead of yeah. um muzz muzz skillings yeah 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 i mean i mean yeah. just traded out one amazing bass player for another <laughs> so, yeah yeah whatever yeah I always thought everyone in Living Color had really cool names. Yeah. Like, just everyone has a great name in that band. Like, mm -hmm. Doug Wimbish, Will Calhoun, Vernon Reed, Corey Glover. I mean, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Most they're, they're, as well. they're an am yeah. amazing band, and they're, they're still amazing today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did that that one just barely got nudged out of my list, and it – and. I tried not to overthink it too much, but now that we're talking about it, I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Put that in as like 9.5 or 10 or something, 10.5, something, yeah. something like that. Um, but the way the way that these things work is that, you know, albums that at the time I maybe knew about and it didn't really didn't connect with me or because they were not promoted crazy, you know, in crazy amounts back then, I didn't even know they existed for many years. Um, and so one will end up taking the place of one that I've loved forever just because it's so fucking good. And that's this one right here. Um, I didn't hear this till years later, and it's really grown on me so much recently, and that yes. is Water by uh, Saigon Kick. Um, which is funny enough, like, has become my favorite Saigon Kick album. Like the more that I listen to this one, the, this the one more... got nudged out just barely. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm the same as you with with what you had with Stain, I had with Water. <laughs> yeah, 
So, because because this is the first one where uh, the original vocalist dropped out, didn't. Well, I don't know. There's there's a lot. There's there's drama even today between him and Jason Beeler. Um, I'm not doing a he sh- who should not be named. I literally his name just escaped me. But um, <laughs> Jason Beeler took over. He was already the songwriter and and partial vocalist. He had backing vocals and and stuff like that, harmony vocals. But he took over as the main vocalist on Water, and the more that I listen to this album, it's it, it to me it's kind of like a, a King for a Day by Faith No More, where there's just such an amazing variety, but yeah. every song is so well written, and it takes you this on this really nice, really enjoyable journey. Some on really great and heavy on song, and on. and on and on is on this, yeah. which to me is one of the best songs ever. Yeah. Um. So it ended up being on here, but yeah, in 93, I didn't know about this album. Like, I don't remember seeing a music video or something. And I, and I don't, I think it was more, you know, not very well promoted in America. I think it was promoted better overseas, maybe, um, especially in Japan, because I think they ended up being really so big in Japan that one of their albums was only released in Japan later on. Wow. Um, but yeah, Water to me um, has become my favorite Saigon Kick record, and um, yeah, I did, it, it had it had to go here. But um, at, from from this point on, we're talking albums that have been a part of my life so much that they are just in my DNA. Um, but you know, give give water a lot a lot. I mean, I'm we're we're humans. We're made mostly of water, so. Hmm. There you go, um, but yeah, but so it had to, it went there, um, but to be to, yeah, to be honest, if you give me like another ten years, that water may like you know ri- the water may rise, and hey. it may it may become even higher on the list. If we're still doing this in ten years, uh, check check back check. Bend look, your um, ass, hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> How many fuck? I just I just imagine a scenario where I'm in my mid fifties. And I'm still doing not only YouTube videos, but also cranked and ranked. How many videos would that be? Because because I do at least one video and and one cranked and ranked a week. That's how the schedule is. Yeah. And so that they're gonna run out of room on 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 YouTube. <laughs> they're gonna. But I feel like you know so many people are gonna be dropping off over the years if YouTube continues. And and I I feel like I'm still going to be here because I can't imagine not doing this because it's such a good outlet for me. Yeah. And 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 it's it's everything I've always wanted to do, just like you know being able to talk about this stuff. So it's just crazy to me to think that like yeah, if everything goes right, I could I could still be here doing this in ten years. Yeah, absolutely. Like I haven't because I've been. My focus has been elsewhere in terms of my creative outlet for, uh-huh. I, th- I think the last, I think the last video I posted to YouTube was nine months ago. And that's largely due to my focus on the band and, you know, other. And you moved, you moved too. I, I did move house. Uh, there's, there's other c- career aspects that, uh, mm-hmm. that, uh, for, for the sake of, <laughs> for the sake of saving face, I'm not going to mention on the, mention on the show just cause. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just well, keep it's not, that, on the, it, keep, keep that on the DL. That sounds like you're doing something you, you're ashamed of. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's not. It's let me. I'll, I'll, I'll con- confirm with everyone that he's doing. He's doing something great. Yeah, that's cool. all we need to say. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gambling on Twitch. <laughs> no, no, um, he's making snuff films. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, no, God. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, uh, oh. By the way, uh, I checked out on um, Wikipedia with the timeline thing. Uh, uh-huh. Matt Kramer is the singer of Matt Kramer on the, on the first two Sogo yeah. albums. Yeah, yeah. Very recently, the there's been, there was drama because Jason Beeler announced like a mini tour to celebrate the anniversary of of Water. And Matt Kramer is not on the album, but yet Matt Kramer took it upon himself to start bashing him, saying that he owes him money 
and his whole career has been based on him trying to sound like him and all oh. of this shit. And, and of course, Jason tried to hold his tongue as long as he could, but then he just posted this long thing where he kind of made up a, how he had an idea for a movie. And it was literally just him <laughs> putting the in the, in the scenario of him and Matt, uh, but making them like superheroes or whatever. It was actually pretty <laughs> funny, but, um, and it's, it sucks that that shit still happens because like people are backing Matt Kramer cause he's on the first two Saigon kick albums. But at the same time, it's like when you're the person who's not currently still doing things and you're chiming in to talk shit, it doesn't look too good on you because it just looks like you don't have anything better to do and you're trying to get some sort of recognition, which nobody's taking that away from him. Everyone recognizes that he's the singer on the first two albums, and the first two yeah. albums are fantastic. Um, but uh, whatever, I, I, it just uh, it's just funny to me that grown ass men still have to get online and complain about things th th that way. Like I can understand if something if somebody really did something wrong to you, there's a way to come out and be mature about it, but he didn't do that it's like the it's like the dude the dude that guy for a little while that was coming out claiming that he wrote all of the early anthrax songs or some shit like that i don't really remember who it was yeah but his but his whole demeanor was like i'm a giant douchebag listen to me <laughs> just like no that's not how you do it but whatever yeah. whatever anyway moving on sorry <laughs> <laughs> no worries well uh where are we at number six yeah uh, yeah number six okay so my number six we continue to to dive deep my number six is inhaler by tad oh another one this is so great this i love where this is going because that would be if we did a top 20 that would be in the top 20. oh such a good album and some i love representing tad all the time yeah so uh yeah yeah, yeah. so so this is the album by tad i'm the most familiar with and i remember when i was like when i got really really deep into grunge maybe like yeah late like mid to late 2013 into 2014 was mm -hmm. was like 2012 and the first half of 2013 for me you know the, the ages of 14 and 15 i was very much the surface level big four or five grunge bands you know yeah, yeah, yeah. nirvana pearl jam soundgarden alice in chains stent on the pilots a little bit of l7 in there um but then, you know, I found out that there was this uh, Wikipedia page called List of Grunge Bands and Artists. And I just went, yeah, to, I just went to town on it. And I basically just went through and any that also had the tag alternative battle, I was like, I'm going to enjoy this. So I stuck on Inhaler and I was just like, this is grunge. Yeah. And it has double kick and, and yeah. it's got heavy riffs. And I was like, it's their it's their most metal sounding album for sure yeah and i just remember listening to it thinking this if i was to sit down and write something it would sound like this uh -huh. this is very much where my creative brain is at when it comes to crafting metal songs you know yeah yeah uh, and it's just so good i mean grease box throat locust luminol i love luminol because it's got that cool like piano bit where it goes like really mellow uh -huh. out, out of nowhere and like it still keeps up keeps up with the beat and that but like it goes acoustic and piano and like it's just such a creative song yeah. and then i also as well dude that like midsection breakdown dun 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 yeah i just remember that the one time i was i was listening to this album in the shower and that song came on and it just hit different and i just found myself like shampoo in my hair like and i just kind of turned and looked at the bluetooth speaker in the windowsill and I just went oh 
<laughs> they, just went back, they just went back to it, but it was just one of those slow head turn. Yeah. Nice. And then I went back to it, but yeah. I mean, it's great. And Tad is great. Yeah. And and there's like there's a real progression with their albums where yeah. it's like what's the first album called? God's Balls. God's Balls. Yeah. Uh, yeah. God's Balls. And then there's Salt Lick. Then Eight Which Way is, Santa. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it, it basically they just get better and better at writing songs. Yeah. Uh, and Inhaler was their major label album. Which is yeah. which was like when bands like Tad could get signed to a major and and yeah. like like I say all the time, um, that that sort of thing, even though it was looked down upon by some people, for for younger like teenagers like me, like it, it turned me on to bands that I otherwise would not have known, and um, yeah. so all of these sort of lesser known bands that got their shot at a major label. If they if their video got played on Headbangers Ball once or somewhere or I saw it once, then I probably bought their album and have been a fan. And it was like that little push that I can't be the only one. There had to have been a whole lot of people that got into Tad uh, through that album. So yeah, yeah, this is Tad's an episode we gotta do, man. I'm gonna add that yep. to the. I'm gonna add that to the fucking list. I'm I'm stoked because they for record store day next month they announced they're doing infrared riding hood uh, oh, as shit. one of the re-releases. So you bet your fucking ass. That's the only one I don't have. So um and I've been waiting cuz like you know old old school copies are not cheap because it you know was later on in the 90s and it's not um I think that was 96 I think. I don't know. But uh yeah. but yeah. While we're on the subject, I'm going to add Skin Yard and Grunt Truck as an episode as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, how many how many Skin Yard albums are there? Is there more I than think, is there three? I think there's five actually. Oh, oh wow! I didn't. Wait. There's actually a lot more Skin Yard albums than I realized. Than I oh. thought. I think there's actually like five or six. And there's Skin six. Yard, Skin Yard was Jack and Dino's band, right? The producer guy, the yeah, that did yeah. the early Nirvana and Soundgarden and everything. Yeah, that that yeah, that's a great band too. Those those bands that were the fr- the I keep saying the word fringy. That's the my word of the episode, um, but they were like you know grungy but me- metalish. Yeah, like those are like my favorites, and that's what that's what I've always felt is grunge, is that if it's if it feels alternative and metal. Then, then I'm like, that's grungy. Bada boom, yeah. bada bing. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love Inhaler. I love mm-hmm. Tad. Um, nothing quite like, I just remember what quick thing while we're on it. I just remember I used to go for walks a lot around uh, this place called Cardinum Woods. Mm-hmm. And there's like, there's like four entirely different routes you can take around this like whole forested area. And I just remember like walking around during the day while it was like kind of wet and just like the really earthy rain smell, but like also walking around and just listening to stuff like Tad and, yeah. and just, and just thinking for some reason I'm out in nature, but it's like, I'm out in nature and it's heavy and it's cool. You know, I don't know. He thought I was doing a thumbs up. Look, and I'm oh. not doing a thumbs up. Uh, oh, oh. Well. Do the lasers. Do the lasers. Oh, lasers. Let's do lasers. Late, Sorry, lasers. guys. Sorry, podcast listeners. <laughs> Dude, I'm I, I'm still... I'm going to try and do another update while I'm here because I don't have to get home tonight. Um, I'm going to update after the show so I, too, can get lasers. I yeah. want lasers. You know what? Sorry, it's, uh, sorry to the audio listeners right now who have no idea what's happening. Something just started playing. I hate when my phone just starts playing. <laughs> What the fuck even is this? It's some podcast that's playing. Just fuck off. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even. Okay. Sorry. That that was totally. That's not even. Nobody can even <laughs> see what's going on. It's just me uh, having technology issues. All right. Are we moving on to number number six? Yeah, dude. Yeah. All Over right. Yours. This is once again an album that like I can't believe it's at six. It should be higher, but it's not. Um, heart work from carcass nice. is, I, I uh, knew you'd, you'd have this on. Oh, here. fuck. Yeah. This is one of my favorite Shit. albums of all time. 
um, the my favorite Carcass album, and it's just in probably one of my favorite metal albums ever made. Mm. Uh, it's I love it. It's I don't even know where to begin with Carcass. We did a Carcass episode um, going through yeah. like all their different you know little phases and you know the, the way that they progressed. But artwork is just like um, when it came out, it, I was just floored by the guitar work. Yeah. Uh, and and just the the grooviness of it also but um and that that was around the time that like I talk about like the term death metal was used for so many different artists that now people would make these different distinctions for so we were you know morbid angel entombed carcass napalm death they were all death metal um they you know and and it, to me, they still are like it's, you know, I, I try to be a little bit more encompassing and say extreme metal because that just, OK, they they all fit in there. But back then, you know, nobody said extreme metal. I don't think I never heard anyone say that back in 1993. But yeah, Heart Work was just an album that came out and I was I, I saw the video for, for the song Heart Work. And I just remember being like, holy shit, it, is this the best metal song ever written yeah. and just immediately like i just fell in love with the album and it's just it's um it's just amazing it's just, i love i love it so much and um and I, I love carcass one of my favorite bands but it didn't even make the top five did not even make the top five um because the top five is stacked ladies and gentlemen nice. so but heart work you know brings us in to the top five because it rules cool so i guess we can get cracking on with the with the top fives yep so my number five is the self-titled debut album from candlebox all right nice yeah this and, wasn't really a contender but i do love this album and so. my i i that this was like a, a late to the game discovery for me this is like last few years i've yeah. really gotten into this but I mean, if if an ain't got everything I like about grunge condensed into into a, an eleven track runtime, they're they're I, way more Pearl Jammy, yeah, than, uh, than anything else. They they definitely occupy this this like meeting point between Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, a, maybe a slight bit of Alice in Chains in there, but. I mean, this, like Stone Temple Pilots, gets unfairly dogged for quote-unquote jumping on the grunge bandwagon. But, you know, this album rules. Like The yeah. production is great. The performances have so much energy, and the songs have a weight to them that genuinely feels like you took everything that worked about grunge and distilled it into an album. And this yeah. is a damn good debut. Uh, I mean, the songs on it, what we got, we yeah. got Don't You change is so good like when that chorus hits just oh not to mention the copious use of chorus effect across the entire album which i am yeah. a huge huge advocate for there's not enough chorus yeah. anymore um far behind far behind is one of my favorite songs in the 90s like yeah. that song is incredible uh and if i if i remember right far behind was one of those cases where they couldn't improve upon the demo. So that's actually the demo hmm. of that song. Um, that they just fixed up for the album. Yeah. If I remember right, that's the one where they did like a studio version and they didn't, they didn't think it had the same energy as the demo. So they just sort of polished up the demo for that. Wow. So, so it's a, it's a slave to the grind sort of slave scenario. to the grind. Yeah, yeah. 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 One of those things, which is, wow. I mean, if you have the means to do that, cause sometimes it, that's just the, I, I remember bands that like I knew back in the, back in Austin that put out demos. And then when they did their album, I'd always kind of go, ah, oh, man, the demo had such a better energy to it. And so sometimes yeah. I'm like, if your demo really slaps as the kids say, um, then just polish it up and put it out. Cause it's, yeah. And do something new for your album. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. Absolutely. Sorry. I had a, I had a big ass Cornish pasty for uh, <laughs> nice for, uh, dinner tonight. Rep, rep in my county. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's 
It's great. And yeah. they're uh, stood in a field of flowers wearing grungy outfits, uh, looking moody with a, you know, kind of distorted, high saturation, high contrast filter over them. Very yeah. 90s, very 93. Uh, and I think if, if there are any grunge fans out there who haven't listened to this because it's a bandwagoning album, I implore I, you to listen to it. It will change your mind. I feel like now. I feel like the only people that still feel that way are the slightly older people who were around back then who thought it was cool to shit on those bands. Yeah. Um, but anybody else, I think that that's a that's an opinion that's completely it has to be gone by at this point because Candlebox have proven themselves as a great band. I mean, they, I mean they, they I saw them open for Metallica and they yeah. you know they were. I didn't really give them that much of a chance because I wanted it to be Alice in Chains at that show. Yeah. Uh, and it was supposed to be, but you know, whatever. Man, like it, what happened with Alice in Chains is so sad, dude. Like, yeah, they didn't yeah. tour very long at all. Like, yeah, as a, as, a, as a touring band, once they really got going, they were, was it like 93 was the last time they toured? And then it, that was it until 96. And even that fell through. That's wild. yeah I don't think they did very even very many shows in 96 I don't I don't know I but yeah they yeah they they I mean because I mean when you have a drug addict in your band it uh, yeah. causes problems unfortunately don't do drugs kids no. um, and you know and, and, and if you want to be especially uh, heroin if you, if you want to be like in a great band um just just do a little weed maybe a little maybe a little um LSD or something I don't know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you does anybody do that anymore? What's the equivalent of LSD? Is it Molly? Is that what it be these days? Oh, I don't know. Um, hallucinogen don't know. kind of stuff, ecstasy. Anyway, <laughs> there's a line. There's a line from like one of those fake talk shows uh, on GTA. What is it? Where they're like interviewing the the in universe hybrid of of um, Stallone and Schwarzenegger, Jack Howard, sir. That's the one. He has a line where he gets like pressed for his drug use on an interview, and he's like, uh -huh. "I don't do drugs. I'd rather die than use drugs. I mean, I use steroids and some recreational blow, but come on." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, Candlebox. Candlebox is a. It's a I like that one. Good stuff. Um, Me like. All right, top top five. The, I'm not fucking around now, folks. Uh, he number five around chaos ad from yes. Sepultura is number five i'm and... gonna jump in and say it's my number four so we, we can count oh, out here. sweet yeah. yeah yeah so chaos ad is amazing it's uh it my favorite Sepultura albums kind of swap around all the time but the one that holds the most nostalgia for me is chaos ad just because it's the one that came out after I became a Sepultura fan. Like I came, I became a fan with Rise. And then I remember this album coming out and it being such a, a big deal. And once again, nobody I talked to said anything about them changing their sound because we were all just like, they made a fucking badass album. Yeah. Who the fuck cares what, what kind of metal it is? And so, um, and that, that, I feel like that's another opinion that's probably kind of gone away over the years. I think everybody can agree that KSAD is fucking brilliant. Hell yeah. Um, but I yeah, like it just... Roots is the more divisive one, I think, nowadays. But even that yeah. is held in very high regard. Oh, yeah. But KSAD was just one of those things where it was metal kind of going in the direction of like like I said the kind of stuff that like speaks to the musician in me because I was into helmet and biohazard and shit like that um and then chaos ad becomes like this perfect like metal I don't gro groove I, I, don't, I don't even like to call it groove metal because there's things about it that are still there's still some thrashiness in there but also like there's a lot of like them just experimenting with like songwriting and and obviously percussion and like all sorts of other stuff and it's just one of those albums that production wise still sounds amazing song wise is still a banger completely all the way through and it 
it remains that way. Like, and it's crazy to think of, you know, all, all these albums, you know, some of them I could understand hearing them and saying, well, that, that doesn't quite hold the same power that it did in 93. But I feel like KSAD is one where it's undeniable. It's still fucking rules. So yeah. you, you, you can take over here. I was just going to say that it kind of just barely preempted the, the groove metal change into the guard by about one year. Yeah. And they were definitely ahead of the curve, you know, not, not in the sense of they saw things were changing and wanted to, you know, hop on anything. They just naturally progressed to a point where they were like, we really like playing groovy shit. Yeah. You know? yeah. They'd done the brutal thrash thing for like, what was it like four releases in a row at that point? So it makes sense that you'd want to branch out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this- and to be, and to be, and to be fair, if you go back and listen to arise, there's a whole lot of sort of mid tempo and a little bit of grooviness on that one. So it's yeah, really, it's kind of the logical n- next step for what they were doing. I mean, in hindsight, anyway, it's easy to yeah. say that. Hell, it, Inner Self from um, fucking Beneath the Remains has some like groovy parts to it like that. Yeah. Like, it's got the kick there, but it's chugging away like a fucking locomotive. But I mean, th- this album took them in a really cool direction where not only were they able to infuse groove into the mix, but also a little bit more of their Brazilian flair to it. Because yeah. there's. They, there's a lot more of that on roots, but mm-hmm. you hear it creep in with like like that yeah. samba kind of percussion going on is a cool little thing that sets them apart, you know? Yeah. From the yeah. back. You know, that they're, they're proud to be Brazilian and have that going for them, you know. Um honestly though, I remember hearing this album really early on in being a, a metalhead, maybe like when I was about like 13 i heard this album Mm -hmm. talking like 2011 maybe and i just remember thinking this is the logical next step from where i was at at the time because i was metallica slayer yeah a little bit of megadeth a little bit of anthrax but then i heard this and i was like oh okay so it can also be like this and then i suddenly realized just makes me want to fucking move. <laughs> you know? yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it came, it, it, it was released just before what I personally believe to be the birth of modern metal as we know it now with the combination of um, Korn's debut and mm-hmm. um, Burn My Eyes by Machine Head. I feel like those two albums and then just a year later, with that, you've got Slaughter of the Soul by At The Gates. And I feel like in the span of two years there, you've got pretty much the blueprint for everything that came after that. Yeah. Because no more, no longer was the emphasis on... It was... Yeah. And then harmonize lead, harmonize lead. You know... Um, yeah i i love this album though like this mm-hmm. this is a this is a rager this is like a brutal um <laughs> gritty reality but also you could kind of party to it also at the same time in a strange way you yeah know? you know it takes on the streets chug 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 oh yeah know? oh yeah you know? yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely speaking of that he's finished finishing his beer Oh. I'm I'm getting to the end. I'm getting to the end. I'm I'm pacing it. You know, I'm making it last. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like like I say, Chaos AD, Sepultura, 1993. Over to you. All right, man. We are we man. We're 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 rounding the the whatever you call it the corner to <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to the top. This is another one that I'm just like, how is this only number four? But it, it, this is how it, it works out. Um, Sound of White Noise by anthrax oh, cool. ends up being number four and i love i love I, mean, I love all these albums i will say that about everything 
Sound of White Noise was another big deal for me because I was really into Anthrax and I was very bummed out that Joey wasn't in the band anymore. But the strength of the of only the single they put out before the album came out. And so I went and bought it when it came out because I was just like, well, that song's great. So maybe I'll end up liking this. And I did. I was... And to me, I think it's one of the best Anthrax albums. I don't, I don't, one hundred percent love all of the John Bush stuff. Although I do, I think John Bush is great, and there's some really great music that came out around that time. But to me, Sound of White Noise is the is the one of of that of the John Bush era that stands up with all of their classics for me. Just because it, just like you know, like like Independent, it's Dave Jordan production, and it sounds like very few other albums yeah and um and it's just got so many great songs on it and that's the that's the thing is is that i i love and i and i i get kind of exhausted sometimes because even even every year go another year goes by and another person on the internet is putting up some sort of video about how all of these bands made their worst albums around this time. So they're talking about Sound of White Noise. They're talking about uh, uh, fucking um, uh, Force of Habit by Exodus. Like all of these, all of these albums that like w- we're supposed to not like. And Black really, album bad because not flash. Yeah, they're yeah. yeah they're only real, and they present them as facts. So fuck these people. Yeah, that's um, annoying. But but it's the only. It all boils down to they did something different and different is bad in the metal world. And so, and it just, and it just so happened that a lot of bands were doing similar things at the same time, but I guarantee fucking to you. And I've probably said this so many times on different parts of my channel. I guarantee fucking to you that so many of them wanted to do this. And then Metallica being successful, they all went, Oh fuck, we can do this. Yeah. And so, you know, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily what happened, but it had to have had some sort of, of, a, of, you know, at least nudging the door open a little bit where, you know, these bands are like, oh, we, yeah, we're kind of sick of doing the same shit over and over again. And so let's do these. And so you get, you know, the ritual by, uh, by Testament and just these albums that are so fucking amazing, but these weird quote unquote metalhead people that feel like in order to come across as a real metal dude, you're supposed to not like these. And for the most part, I feel like they haven't even really heard them. They've just heard other people say they're bad and they're like, yes, let's all get together and say they're bad. So we know we're metal. And it's just like for every person that says that they're all like, well, Seasons of the Abyss is a great album. And then other people will be like, well, fuck Seasons of the Abyss. It's only good when they did Raining Blood. Like, no, no, yeah. only Show No Mercy is the only good Slayer album. I'm like, well, where does it fucking end? Just shut up and like what uh, you it, like. And Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's like I always bring it back to uh, Metallica. They sold out when they made Load because they cut their hair. And then you just go back and you can trace it you can trace it there's a clear lineage with every single album where someone has something to say because about. they're jealous that they're not in fucking metallica Garen but fucking yeah D, yeah yeah they've like, been selling out since fade to you know, black since 1984 every, <laughs> yeah hell you could fucking argue that they sold out when they made a fucking album with kill em all if they were a real they kicked true, out dave that was their yeah. first sellout yeah, their first sh- <laughs> their first sellout was existing because playing gigs is selling out. You know, yeah, yeah it's it just fucking bugs me. Load, yeah, it, 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 they cut their hair. The black album too commercial. The fucking justice, they made a video. Puppets, ride the lightning. I can't think of anything bad to say about puppets. They yeah. Made a ballad <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, neither can anybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's just it's one of those things where where it's like, do you think anyone with a girlfriend cares about this? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's like, but it's like, the, yeah, that's the, that's the thing is it don't like just stop using the term sellout unless you have one hundred percent proof that somebody came to them with a check and said, here's money if you do this, 
then they did it. I, I'm I'm cool with that being a sellout. But just trying to be more accessible with your music, that's not selling out. That's fucking maturing and growing and doing something different. And yeah. and, and and there have been other bands that have done the opposite where they were a little more simple and to the point in the beginning and got more complex and and nobody looks at them and be like they sold out because they started getting more complex and it's like yeah. no bands go on their journey and yeah. if they you sold don't out like to it, the prog fans you know if you don't if you don't like it then you just stop stop listening but like the 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 fact that so many people still feel the need to make videos Talk, just regurgitating this groupthink mentality yeah. of like, no, this is what's been established as bad. So I'm going to make a video and join in on this. And it's just like, go fuck yourself. Cause like, yeah. we don't need it anymore. We don't need that anymore. That's like, Absolutely. That, we need more people just to, cause like, especially in the world of, of, of metal, like so many metal bands can't afford to fucking tour anymore. And yeah. so, what you should be doing if you feel like putting your stupid face on the internet just like me talk about the shit that you love give it a push don't shit yeah. on stuff because you're just wasting your time and you look like a dumbass yeah. and and it doesn't matter because like there's a specific person that i'm referencing in my head who on youtube has three times the subscribers that i do and they do shit like that so they're encouraged to be an edge lord because people watch it and so those people you're part of the problem too because it the way that it should work in a perfect world is i should have millions of subscribers first off but second <laughs> off the, fir the, the first time somebody puts out a video and says i'm gonna talk about how saying anger is shit literally everybody in the world should go fuck you and leave like that, that should be how it works but whatever this is the the world thrives no, i don't know about the world but a lot of the world thrives on negativity because people are people are it, it, down to their core people are shit people yeah. equal shit <laughs> slipknot got it right all right i may yeah. not be a slipknot fan but for the most part people equal shit none of you you're, yeah. you're all you're all out there you're all the best but we're but think about it we're a small we're a minority in this mm -hmm. in this world so it's uh, sorry it's rant over no, honestly, I'm very much with you because it's very that it is metalheads who only listen to one specific genre of metal and believe they're like some supreme race or something. It's a fucking, it's a crabs in the bucket mentality where it's like, oh, this one's finally figured out how to get out. Eh, eh, pull yeah. you back down, you know, because it just, you either want metal to be a successful thing yeah or you want musicians to not be able to afford food simply yeah. put like you know at, at the end of the day it, it's like do you want these guys to be a fucking band or do you want these guys to not be able to tour not be able to make an album and inevitably have to split because yeah. no one can afford to do anything you know man a, a very a very timely example of that is slayers coming back now I don't know if Slayer's coming back to make albums, but they're coming back to play shows for sure. Um, and and you can look at it and be skeptical or 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 cynical. Like I I honestly do have cynical thoughts in my head. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, well, somebody somebody needs a paycheck. Somebody got somebody you know was 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 used to a certain lifestyle and the money's yeah. running out. <clears throat> but that. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because if I feel that way, same thing with like the Pantera thing. Um, I, I don't. I went. I saw the Pantera thing because I went to see Metallica. But otherwise, I wouldn't have gone. But guess what? That's just what I did. I don't want them to not be successful because yeah. they're they're doing whatever they're doing. And with Slayer, it's the same thing. If tons of people want to go see Slayer, great. I hope it's successful. But I don't really feel like I want to go. But I'm just I'm do I'm doing me and I'm not trying to shit on other people. So there if there are people out there that are literally for first four metallic albums or I don't listen to any metal made after 87 or whatever, that's fine. Like you you everyone is their own individual and I don't expect yeah. anybody to like all the things. Um 
And I know I know that there are some people who really don't listen to music that much, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you have your your core music that means something to you, and you don't like all this other stuff. There's nothing wrong with that either. What the you you go from being just your own person to a piece of shit when you feel the need to start shitting on other things because yeah. that's not your little world, and and that's when you become you go from being whatever to being a shitty person. And you're not doing anything but making the world worse. So stop. Stop it. Oh, I really want to do another episode of um, <laughs> us reading awful uh, reviews. We, on, whoa, yeah. Hell yeah, we do. Encyclopedia Metal. Because, like, it's just, it's just fun to poke holes in these arguments. <laughs> it's just real fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but it, it, I mean, it's never going to end because, like I said, there's an audience out there for shit people. That's why, that's why there's so many reality shows based around awful people, and they make shitloads <laughs> of money. And I don't, I've never, I've never understood that because I never, I don't get any enjoyment out of that. Like I don't want to watch awful people. I don't know. <laughs> when, when they're real people, like I'll watch. Yeah always sunny in philadelphia um all the time because i love that show and everyone in that show is an awful person <laughs> <laughs> i want to see something like love island but everybody is an elitist in their respective genre so like we just take Ooh. like we take like 12 people who you know you've got someone who only listens to black metal you got someone who only listens to you know 70s metal and i just feel like it, it would be fun to see the this like clash of of personalities yeah yeah i still wouldn't watch that either <laughs> yeah. no, no. <laughs> but the network might have a place for that show yeah anyway get um, sam dunn on board and we're away hey all right yeah, yeah. sam Anyway, what, what were we? Yeah, because I, 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 I was talking about Sound of White Noise, which I love Sound of yeah. White Noise so much. That's my, that's my shirt, my Sound of White Noise. Shirt. Nice. Um, yeah, that's what that is. It's uh, you can't really see, you know. Sweet. Um, anyway, um, but brings us into our top three. So we're, yeah. shit's getting real, folks. Okay, this is where things take a turn where they become very personal for me. Oh, so shit. These, okay. So these are my uh, top three of 93. There's there's still that one album that I'm like, it has to be in here somewhere. And if not, I'll be surprised. But look, let's find out. I'm now realizing that... Uh, fuck's sake, did it happen again? Okay, right. I'm saying this now. I'm saying oh, this shit. now. Oh, I shit. I, I have a stipulation, okay, because this happened with the 92 episode, right? God. It released... Oh, my God, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to happen again. Get ready. It, re it released in the U.S. in 93. I was under the assumption it released everywhere in 93. It is technically a 92 release in Europe because for some reason they released this album like almost a year later in the US. Okay, I'm going to let you get uh, t get a pass because my number one album was originally released in the UK at the end of 92. Okay. But it came out over here and was not was a legit release in 93. So I yeah. I I was under the impression that this was a full-blown 93 release. Okay. That being said, because because they are American and it released in their homeland, yeah, in '93, I'm I'm giving myself the pass. There. I'll be I'll, I'll be the judge of this. What is it? My n number three is Kingdom of Desire by Toto. Oh fuck! I don't. I have I have no stake in this game because I'm just like I don't remember the album coming out in '93. So you could have just <laughs> you could have just said it, and I never would have known. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, this album is an album by the band I believe to be the best band. Full yeah. stop. Yeah. Like, I would say it, I have a top five bands. Toto are number six. But objectively, when I listen to their music, I think these guys are incapable 
of putting out you, a bad song. You you just feel like when it comes to the 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 idea of what a perfect band could be, that Toto yeah. is the best representation of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You get a super group of session musicians, yeah, and you get them to make albums. You inevitably end up with some pretty damn good stuff. Yeah, uh, and I think Kingdom of Desire is a cool time capsule because they were stripped back all the way to a four piece for this. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, you know, as a, as a studio band live, they would have a few extra yeah. uh, touring, touring musicians because their, their music calls for that. Cause there's so many parts, but I mean, you've got Jeff Picaro on drums, Mike Picaro on bass, David Page doing all of the keys and Steve Lukather guitars and lead vocals, right? This album is awesome. They which, which that's almost like a Saigon kick kind of thing because originally Steve Lukather wasn't the main vocalist. No, no. Because then... well, they, they went through they they'd gone through three uh -huh. um, lead vocalists. Although Steve always sang at yeah. like like every other song. Yeah. Like, but, but he didn't uh, sing like the the ones that we know so well. Those aren't aren't him. Like he didn't sing "Hold the no. Line" and and Africa. No, no, yeah. those are um, those are Bobby Kimball and, and David Page. But yeah. by the time by the time this album came around, his voice had matured to this like really gritty, raspy point where mm -hmm. you listen to like earlier Toto, Toto albums and you can tell like he's a younger man. Yeah. By the time he'd reached this point, he was like late thirties, like early thought forties, and the dude's voice just sounds so bluesy, raspy, and cool. Yeah. All of we did we did a Toto playing. episode, everyone. If you're interested, we did we, we, a Toto ranking many three years ago. It's been shit. It's been a while. Yeah, coming up on it, like I, that was a two part or two because yeah. there's just so much to talk about. But like. See, this is a prime example of people not knowing jack shit. All Music gave it a 2 out of 5. No Toto album is lower than a 4. I'm sorry. That is, <laughs> that is, that is, that is the truth. That is the truth. And yeah. I'm going to say, if, if you're a fan of um, hard rock, and by extension, if you're a fan of hard rock with a little bit of funk metal flair added to it, this is a, a must-listen. Granted, it's got its it's got like three power ballads on it, but like all of the rocking tracks are they're rock songs, they're hard rock songs. Gypsy Train, yeah, Gyp Gypsy Train could have been like one of the more mid tempo Van Halen songs. Don't Chain My Heart is incredible. Never Enough is great. How many times could have been an extreme song? Um, two Hearts had this album come out two years earlier. That would have been a massive radio hit. Mm -hmm. Wings of Time is my personal favorite on the album. Um, anyone who hasn't heard this song, I highly, highly recommend to to listen to this as the sun is setting and just drive with the windows down blasting. This is fucking awesome. She Knows the Devil is just funk rock goodness. Sass dripping from it. Other Side, Only You are a couple power ballads. Uh, Kick Down the Walls is a cool song. Uh, Kingdom of Desire, the title track. That's another epic song, dude. Like, that and Wings of Time. There is no good reason as to why this album isn't critically fucking acclaimed. Because every yeah. time I've listened to this album, this is one of the most... This is one of the most unfairly unrecognized albums. Yeah. By... Of, of all time. And like, even though it doesn't have Bobby Kimball on it, who is probably the most iconic Toto voice. Yeah. I mean, and and this is the most. Would I say it sounds the most bare bones? No, I would say Tambu is probably the most bare bones they ever sounded. But I mean, Kingdom of Desire is just such a good album. And the I mean, I remember being very surprised at how good their later day stuff was. Yeah, you can see what I mean when I say like this is a band incapable of writing bad music because even yeah. at a, even if it's not necessarily your style, you can't deny the amount of talent it takes to write songs like these. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, what else? What else can I say? I mean, <laughs> yeah, 
they have hard rock songs on other albums, but this, I mean, how the title track from Falling In Between is a prog metal song as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. But as a full experience, this album is Toto as a hard rock band and it's great. You know, depending on which version you get, the song Kick Down the Walls may or may not be present. Um, I like the song, so I, I'd like I'd like it to be there. You know, it's, it's got a few ballads, but, you know, it's an early 90s hard rock album. What early 90s hard rock album didn't have a couple power ballads on it, you know? Yeah. Even the Black yeah. Album had that. So, and it, honestly, it's great. And it's a highly, highly underrated slab of goodness. And every time I get to preach the good word of Toto, I, I I do so with full sincerity. Anyway, that's that's my number three. Sweet. So my number three is uh, is um I, this is a this is a very special one because okay. it's oh fuck I'm just gonna do it. It's my favorite soundtrack of all time. Um, last yes! action hero, the last action hero soundtrack. Uh, to a movie that I also love the movie and really enjoyed the movie when I saw it in the theater. But this everything I was saying about, you know, soundtracks back when I was talking about Judgment Night, just the amount of hype for, I guess, probably just people my age and maybe a little older, because uh, so many singles off this came out. I think it was Big Gun and I think either angry again or what the hell have I had it came out before the movie before the soundtrack and then the soundtrack came out right before the movie and we all bought it and I am a fan of like every band on here yeah and especially the fact that it does have Alice in Chains Megadeth Def Leppard Anthrax two two unreleased Alice in Chains songs on this and at the time yeah an unreleased Megadeth, unreleased Anthrax, which I think one is, is one of the best Anthrax songs. And um, to top it off, Cypress Hill, Fishbone, it's just, it's just so fucking good. And then, you know, of course, I, I went to see the movie and the movie didn't do well at all, which always baffled me because it's to me, it's such a great movie. Like, it's just so much yeah. fun. But the soundtrack itself is just one that has not lost. In fact, it, it has gained um like love for me over the years just because it's not only just filled with amazing songs but it really is like along with the judgment night soundtrack a snapshot of that particular time when when i was so like when music became nothing else in the world was more important to me than music and this just sort of covers everything you know because it does have hip-hop on there as well and it does have you know acdc like older rock stuff metal stuff and it's just to me the greatest soundtrack ever just based on like the quality of the songs the fact there are songs that were new for this soundtrack it's just uh yeah i love i love the last action hero soundtrack so much um, it, it, but it, if we were doing soundtracks, no spoiler alert, if we do a top 10 soundtracks, it's going to be number one. Sorry. Sorry to spoil nice. that, but, um, <laughs> it's, it literally is my favorite soundtrack of all time. And I could listen to it every day and never get tired of it. I mean, um, it, that's, that's going to take some beat in that lineup on that album is yeah. ridiculous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane because the fact that you've got, you know, one of my favorite Anthrax songs and one of my favorite Alice in Chains songs, both on that soundtrack. And it's just, it's insane, but it's, yeah, it's just so good. And it's just, to me, it's just aged amazingly well um, as just an example of why 1993 f- fucking ruled for music. Mm. So, all right, we can, we can, we can move on. We're, this is, this is a lengthy episode. Hell yeah. I mean, pff, testament to 1993, I guess. It's yeah, just a fucking. Even though Testament didn't have a studio album out this year, that was ninety two. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my number two, I finally get to set the record straight with this one because I <laughs> mentioned this in the ninety two episode because fucking Spotify had me the, under the impression that it was a ninety two. Are we are we album. doing a repeat because we're now doing ninety three? <laughs> we are doing a repeat. 
<laughs> my my number it's two. It's redemption time. Yeah, finally, finally. Uh, so my number two is set the world on fire by Annihilator, and I this in my opinion this album right here perfectly illustrates why early 90s era thrash is woefully underrated uh like there's so much variety in songs on this album and i love all of them for different reasons like you got the you got the groovy ass title track that epic ballad phoenix rising that hooky thrasher night jumps queen the surprisingly gentle sounds good to me and the borderline mr bungle closer brain dance i mean i fucking love this album and i firmly believe that it doesn't get nearly the respect and recognition it deserves and not to mention that the playing all over this album is phenomenal like they're they're (laughs) so tight yeah everything on this album is great like set the world on fire annihilator let's get the fucking wiki page up let's have a look at this uh, band members aaron randall jeff waters uh on guitars he did a lot of the mixing producing neil goldberg uh <laughs> i almost read that as neil goldman the uh the nerdy kid from family guy uh wayne oh. darley and uh mike mangini is i mean it's got mike mangini on drums so you know it's gonna be fucking good I mean, as he was in Dream Theater for the last ten or so years, but oh yeah, we got we 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 got Portnoy back in yeah. uh, in Dream Theater now, yeah yeah, which is wild. I I genuinely thought Mike Mangini was 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 it now. He was he was the guy, but yeah, basically, I I really enjoy this album, and it's one of those that just I heard I heard one day and it just stuck with me. Is it? perhaps the best quote-unquote thrash album no but it's got so much variety and it sits right in that zone between thrashy but also just kind of straightforward metal too and yeah. there's a little bit of groove in there i just i'm a big fan of variety and mm-hmm. the overall vibe of this album still has that old school metal tone to it i i i enjoy this album yeah it's a good one and he enjoyed it it so much he included it in two top tens in two different years yeah (laughs) go back and watch fault i'm trying to remember i think i think i did something in the video when i edited yeah you did like a (laughs) (laughs) you like put up the fucking wiki article and that yeah I mean, I suppose some of it was recorded in '92, but I'm just saving face at this point. And that's another I mean, all—that's another all music fucking two out of five. Fuck off, all music. You don't know shit. Well, I, I feel, but that is an album that a lot of people don't like, though. Like that's—I uh, mean, which is, but once again, it's that same thing because they did something different. Because they're but, stupid. <laughs> um. All right, moving on. Um, this is my number two. And uh, you already talked about this one, uh, In Utero by Nirvana. Um, Nirvana. And uh, it was, uh, Nirvana is one of my favorite bands of all time. And In Utero, I talked about it already, like listening to it the first time. And um, the uh, Nirvana is like the band that that really sort of kickstarted me uh being interested in being in a band and being a songwriter and musician and whatever. And, um, in utero came out and it was like easily the first time there was like a hugely like anticipated album for me. Um, and not, not only that, it was kind of a shared experience because it was one of those things where it was hugely anticipated, but also, it wasn't just me. It was a it was a million other people who anticipating the album, and so I got to sort of experience that wave of like the promotion and 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 leading up to it and all the things about the album. Like when they first announced it, they said it was going to be called "I Hate Myself and I Want to Die," yeah. um, and then and um, I remember there being a news report on MTV where somebody who had heard early recordings apparently said it was completely unlistenable. 
And I was just Whoa. like, I was like, "Whoa, really? This is going to be that good?" <laughs> because if, like, you know, that like if if some fucking suits from a label are all like, either I don't hear a single. That's when you know it's a good album. But yeah. um, but then of course, Heart Shaped Box comes out, and it's just an amazing song. So it was, I was very much looking forward to this album, and to me, it it really delivers. And I I would say it's the best Nirvana album. I don't know if I can put it above Nevermind as a favorite, just because there's so much history and 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 everything else involved in Nevermind for me. But in Utero, like I feel like they just did, like you said, I feel like it's it's the most sort of honest of what Kurt Cobain kind of wanted to do. Yeah, and um, you know, was was in control of every aspect. I mean, I guess. I guess in a lot of ways he was always, you know, they were never forced to do anything. No. Um, but I feel like maybe he wasn't necessarily as comfortable going in certain directions, but then got more comfortable with it. And in utero, it's just this great combo of like a grunginess, a punkiness, some acoustic stuff on it. And it's just, uh, it's just an album that really aged really well. Like it's, um, it's the unfortunately the you know the the swan song of the band really when it comes to original albums but um i think it caps off their three album run really nicely because like you said it does it got these three different flavors of nirvana and ending it on this album ending it with all apologies it just adds so much weight to that song that that song makes me feel sad every time but i love it because it's one of i think one of the best songs ever written but yeah in utero is just such one of those albums that i just sort of look at as like it's another one of those things that i don't i think in this day and age that album wouldn't have happened because i don't think record labels major record labels these days aren't going to go to a band and say you do your artistic vision no they nobody the balls yeah and 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 not only that i think so many bands are are just trying to make a living and uh and yeah. there was such a big boom with rock music in the in the nine, early 90s that i don't think anybody really thought of it that way nobody really thought of it like well we got to be able to maintain a career and live off of this music. I think there were so many people who were still doing it. Like, I mean, not, that exists today. I understand that. But back then, I think that there, you know, there was more of a, a an openness with record labels around 91, 92, 93, where labels were just like, hey, man, you sold millions of, of albums. We, we trust you to follow this up. And yeah. Some people didn't like it as much as Nevermind, but I understand that. I absolutely understand that, but I love it. And um, yeah, I'm at number two in utero. Cool. So that brings me to my number one. You still haven't said the album that I thought you were going to talk about. Uh, is it the box set one? No. What, which album did you think I was going to mention? Heart released an album in 1993, and I thought for sure... It got nudged out ever wow. so slightly. Wow! And... Sorry, Ann Wilson, you uh, were not included in the top 10 of 1993. Please, please, I had to... I had to, I had to <laughs> biases aside here. <laughs> oh, this is great. Uh, I'm glad we're but, talking about this. Do it. Go for but it. But my number one... Uh, I made an exception for this because normally we don't include live albums in these lists, but because it's such a pivotal moment of my preteen years, uh, watching this and listening to this, it, that this made me the Metallica fanatic I am. It's Live Ship Binge and Purge, uh, the entire box set. I mean, the Seattle 89 show alone is mind blowing, let alone the two San Diego tapes and the Mexico city CDs, depending yeah. on which version you get. Some had cassettes in them, but I mean, holy shit, dude, uh, this thing sat on my uncle's shelf for years. 
and I looked at it. And every time I, every time I happened to like pass by it, if he, if he was like staying here, and for for a while, he had this with him. And uh, usually, usually after a relationship, but uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway, anyway, when I was very young, he he lived here for a while. He he lived here for a while, and I remember seeing this box that just looked really cool. But I was yeah. like too young to reach it because uh, I was very tiny. But I always remember seeing the scary guy and thinking, "Wow, that looks cool. It's got blood dripping off it." Uh, I didn't even notice the little middle fingers at the time, but I thought yeah, yeah. that looks cool, but I have no idea what it is um, until years later. And, you know, we all know what happened with the combined strength of Guitar Hero and the Grand Theft Auto soundtracks. I was like, hey, dude, I, I think I like Metallica. Can I borrow this? I heard the song Master of Puppets. Mm. Uh, and he was like yeah dude go nuts now at the time we still had a vhs player in the front room yeah um this was before we had like the skybox that let you record on tv so i yeah. remember like just like okay which do i start with which do i start with seattle or uh san diego and i think i started with san diego uh because which, i was like which, well this which is, is two tapes so this yeah. is more which is perfect because it starts off with a mini documentary about the band and yeah, so you get it, to learn about metallica right there and so that's yeah. pretty sweet I, and i remember like putting it on and i was like okay this clearly is is going to be some cool stuff and i watched like the whole whole thing and i was like this is this is awesome like i've, I've just learned the entire history up to that point of a band that is now suddenly my favorite and i've heard yeah. like two songs so far and then just as they kept playing i mean i mean what's the what's the set list for san diego the 20 minute metalla movie then enter sandman. Enter, Sa enter sandman then creeping death then harvester yeah. of sorrow and i just remember by 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 harvester of sorrow i was just glued to the screen and, yeah. and I, no word of a lie this was before i had glasses and i, and I was there like <laughs> <laughs> for the podcast like, listeners he's yeah. in he's in awe like I, I was just in awe that I, I remember I remember Flea it like inducted them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and said something to the effect of we heard this song on the radio and we couldn't believe it fucking existed and I just like I know exactly what he's talking about because like yeah. the when I when I saw the you know die da, 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 by my head, I was just like, yeah, like cartoonishly jaw yeah. dropped, like, and just every song just kept getting all you know more and more awesome. And I was like, surely they don't have this many good songs. And then Welcome yeah. Home Sanitarium happens, and then Sad but True happens, and not, then Wherever I May Roam happens. And I'm not just only like, that. You've got you have everyone gets a solo, and you've yeah. got like the do the two drum kit thing with James and Lars, yeah. And it that there's so it's just that I mean, I love the Seattle concert, but that the the San Diego one is probably my favorite Metallica like rec filmed uh, concert they ever did because it's just the band was they were so good. And yeah. they put on this really big, entertaining arena show. And I, I love that. Yeah. And that's before we even get to the Justice Medley. Because, yeah. like, I'd, at that point, I think I'd also heard, I'd heard, like, a select few songs. Mm -hmm. I basically, like, every, my, the same uncle had burned me off a bunch of CDs. And I remember... I would essentially just like pick whichever song looked like it sounded the coolest. Yeah. So, so like, uh, I remember, I remember the exact moment I heard, uh, master of puppets for the first time. It was on a green iPod nano that was only eight gigabytes. And I thought to myself, I don't know that much music. Eight gig will be enough. <laughs> and, then, and now yeah. years later, and I struggle yeah. to fit it on like 250. Um, but like, oh, dude, like, I just remember sit, sitting there and opening it up and I was like, Master of Puppets, puppets can be kind of creepy. 
this is going to be cool. <laughs> it was yeah. Like, click, bang, ding, ding, ding. And then it just kept going. And every new part was just fucking awesome. Uh, Some, sometimes there are songs that, yeah. like, you hear Master of Puppets and you're like, this couldn't be called anything else. The, yeah, the yeah. Master of Puppets. Yeah, man. like <laughs> it just and, fit very fitting. And the th- the thing as well that like that's burned into my mind as well was was my experience hearing "Fight Fire with Fire" for the first time because I'd heard yeah. Whiplash. I'd heard Whiplash at that point, and I thought to myself, "There can't be a song faster than Whiplash. Whiplash is so fast, you know," yeah. which is comparably tame to fight fire with fire you know you go from like i remember when i got to the like harmonized solo part in that song and i'm getting all giddy thinking about it because like you're talking about my favorite album of all time so i feel giddy every time yeah like when i when i look back to like 2010 which was the year I got into Metallica. I think about those moments and how in retrospect, they're such precious moments, you know, like the yeah. first time, the first time you hear a song like that. Um, and that's something I, like, I almost wish I could do again, but I also don't want to sacrifice any of my knowledge of all of this yeah. stuff now where yeah. it's like, I wish I could like pick one song and like, completely forget it so i could hear it for the first time again and honestly remembering how remembering the chills i got the first time i heard the the breakdown in creeping death Mm -hmm. uh, i just you know it it, it's one of those that just it's one of those songs that makes you its bitch (laughs) yeah Yeah. oh dude and i i love the fact that we both have the box set in our rooms kind of behind us yeah oh shit yeah it's like right there yeah, yeah. nice wow that's it's awesome. it's my favorite box set of all time and i just yeah, yeah. i like I, the only reason i didn't include it is because I, I i struggled to call it an album you know just because there's so many different parts but it's it was the it was the thing like that christmas that i wanted more than anything and i got it for christmas and it was it, I wore the fucker. Well, I mean, I I mean, it got it got technically <laughs> stolen from me. Not really stolen, but you know. Yeah. Um. But uh. But yeah, I played it so much. Well, either way, I mean, you can't really go wrong with an album that's eight hours, thirty four <laughs> minutes, and thirty nine <laughs> seconds long, and it's yeah. all awesome. Um. And it and it all and it and that the CDs end with one of my favorite Metallica moments, which is which is. Kirk Hammett going Mexico City, muy fucking bien. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yep. Oh, oh, oh yeah. are you you want you want to see another reason not to take Rolling Stone album guide seriously? Oh, yeah, I mean, I didn't need another one, but okay. They gave it two stars. Gave what two stars? Live ship engine purge. Oh fuck it, just go, you just fucking kill yourself, Rolling fuck, Stone magazine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i can't say i disagree there <laughs> anyway with you that not the two star no yeah yeah no i knew i knew where you were yeah. um brutal so yeah the this is my number one is only super predictable to people that know me very well um because in this album and i think this vinyl version that i have was actually released at the end of 92 but the official release of the album was in 1993. Um, and it's one of my favorite albums of all time. Super influential. You want to have a guess? Do you, get, do you have any idea what it might be? 93. Right at the end of 92. Um, so I'm think, think of it. Think of it. So it's, it's a way lesser known band. That's one of my favorite bands of all time. Oh, shit. I think I can picture him, but I, I can't remember. I'll, ju- I'll jump. Specific. I'll jump. I'll jump into it. Um, I got tunnel. fuck. Yeah, yeah. I had the I had the um, fucking album cover in my mind. Yeah. So creep diets from Fudge Tunnel. And but yeah, because well, because the vinyl is on Earache Records, and I think this came out at the end of '92. But then they had like a deal 
with Columbia Records, and that pushed it out uh, in 93. Uh, but Creep Diets is like the continuation of like the music that inspired me, um, beginning with like albums like Nevermind and moving forward with like Meantime by Helmet. Yeah. Um, but Fudge Tunnel was, <coughs> um, and I've said this on multiple videos on my uh, page, but uh, Fudge Tunnel and Creep Diets specifically um, was the when I heard like the kind of music I wanted to make because they felt like they were right smack in the middle between Nirvana and Metallica. Like they yeah. were metallic, but also felt kind of, kind of punkish and indie and and noisy and weird but you couldn't you couldn't get give fudge tunnel to like a a punk fan um because they probably would think it was too metallic and then you couldn't yeah. really this who somebody who's loves inner sandman would probably think that fudge tunnel was too noisy and that those things about it are what made it this album that just feels like putting down the needle and it's just a record that looks like my face and it's just like yeah and that's because it just feels so much like even today like if i could make my perfect album it would probably sound like creep diets but i'm not that good um but yeah it had to go at my number one just because it's so a part of who i am and something that i discovered in 93 that still i feel like i'm rediscovering it every time i listen to it so um yeah i i remember hearing gray and thinking they sounded like a like a british helmet yeah they, they, yeah i mean but 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 way noisier but i mean yeah but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah they yeah. um and they're another band that has a really nice three album run that kind of gives you kind of a different flavor they're a little more sludgy on the first one and this one is probably the most quote unquote commercial it's not it's not commercial or polished at all but as then, commercial as this kind of thing yeah and and then their third album um is much more groovy metallic um really but still but they all kind of are connected they have a connected vibe um but uh yeah I love Fudge Tunnel and Creep Diets, and it had to be my number one. And uh, just like you with Toto, Fudge Tunnel is like that a band that like any chance that I get to talk about Fudge Tunnel is I'm always going to take because I'm just like, there's not enough love for them, uh, in my opinion. And so they're not my number one. What? You want to you, you do something that's making me kind of crack up? What? Uh, so if you go on Wikipedia and you go on the Fudge Tunnel wiki page, it says from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia in italics, it says for the part of anatomy fudge tunnel is slang for see rectum. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. That's fucking hilarious. It is kind of a gross name, but I've said it so many times over the years that it I, I don't think of it as, as a rectum. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a band. Yeah. Um, but I sometimes I forget about that that you say the words fudge tunnel and people go ugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, one time, one time I remember actually uh, introducing a uh, a member of of Sage, my band, my band uh -huh. Sage. We got a song out called Sick. Uh, it's on st streaming and whatnot. Album coming soon. Very very close to finishing this fucking album, dude. Like, Sweet. But I I remember like just casually bringing up the, the name fudge tunnel and neither of them had heard fudge tunnel and and they they just cracked up but i was like oh yeah it is kind of a funny name <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah if, uh, sp sp speaking of that whenever you guys finish the album you gotta yeah. se send me one so i can start playing it on my station on my we'll do. Yeah. On my on my my radio station that i have now i would ha happily feature some sh some sage um but uh yeah that's it. but that's yeah fudge tunnel and uh that wraps up 1993. Tell and you what, let, let, let me see let me see if i can let me see if i can tease anything I've oh sweet 
I think this is a relatively up to date thing. We have since EQ'd a few things, but world world premiere. How'd you think about that? Uh, That's good. That's some good heavy riffage going on there, man. Thanking you. Okay, I'll click click the little stop share thing. Okay. But well, there you go. Yeah. A little a little sneak peek at Sage, the upcoming album, which is called. Is it, does it have a name yet? The album. It has it has a name. It's called Blinded. Uh, oh, I like that. I, it's very nineties. It, yeah, yeah, and we, we've gone for a very we've gone for a very nineties aesthetic to the to the artwork as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. It'll be, it, it, I'm looking forward to it because, like, the, the way we've got the song sounding now, that what you just heard is dated months back. That's nothing. Oh, sweet. Compared, that's nothing compared to what we got now. So, nice. uh, yeah, All right. looking forward, stay, looking stay forward tuned to that. for that. Sage 2024, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and that ain't even got vocals on it yet. So, looking forward to it. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, on, on that note, with that little gift to everybody, we should we should get the fuck out of here. Thank you very much to all the the peanut butter platypuses and aluminium squirrels and Belvedere ball sitters out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're the best. We got a real um, cast of characters. We we, we really season. do. We really do. <laughs> um, but uh, you guys are the best because you guys are the I love the interaction when I, I you should see the smile on my face when people comment things like that. And I'm just like, it's so yeah. fun, so fun to throw this stuff out there and that people are enjoying it. So um, thank you all for watching and or listening. Um, however, you however you imbibe. No, well, whatever is it? No, it's imb- imbibing <laughs> is like eating or drinking. Right. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. That's it. Well, uh, ne- next week we have a another ranking, and yes. I am. Um, it's a bit of a task for me, but it's <laughs> it's it's doable. Yeah. Um. And and when you see me next, I will be forty six years old. So that's wow. Uh, and my birthday is on March second. And uh, cool. Yeah. So that that'll be. I'll be a year older. I'll look kind of like this, only a few days, like a week older. A little older. <laughs> a little wiser. I'm starting to get hair in really weird places, man. <laughs> yeah. That's that's true. That that I'm I'm way past that. The hair's always has been in weird places for 20 years. So. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. Thanks everybody for listening and and watching. And as usual, if you got your favorites from 93 or albums that we that we missed because there's a there's a lot of really good albums that we didn't even mention and yeah. um because there's especially this there's too many there's too many great ones but um yeah the inter- interactive that's how that's how we like to be so thank you very much for i don't know why so that way it was very weird but i just that's just my brain telling me it's time to end so thanks everybody and as usual i'm going to throw it over to eddie sparks to take us out. Later, dude.